adaptation. It is homeostasis, allostasis, and allostatic load in living systems. We thought that might be a mouthful for promotional purposes, so we settled on allostasis and um, exercise. So dosing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what I think is an important subject, at least for me as an exercise professional, interacting with a living system. Now, as an engineer on a nuclear fast attack submarine running the primary power plant, it was a non-living system, but we still had um, equilibrium issues and system stability issues and ways that we had to operate the plant. And so, you know, my experience in non-living systems uh, definitely carries over to my experiences in living systems. And so um, when we look at exercise and the process of exercise choice and progressions, uh, what I've found over the years is it certainly can be a tricky business because often when you look at someone from the outside, they look fine. And we assume that they're fine and that the, all their systems are green light ready to go. And then you start exercising them and you find out they're not fine. And there's some things that were hidden inside of them that somehow exercise has drawn out and exposed. And so I've spent a lot of time over the years trying to figure out this concept and wanted to share some of these ideas with you that we've uh, uh, come up with here in Columbus, Ohio at Physicians Fitness and, and teach in the coursework in the muscle system specialist course offered by exercise pro ed. And so when we look at, um, you know, definitions and some of the things that uh, that we're going to talk about, I'm a definitionalist and and you're going to see some dev definitions here. I'm not going to, you know, read them to you completely. That's that's going to waste a lot of time. But some of the most important ideas here in terms of homeostasis, right, is this idea that in a living system um, in general, we kind of operate and function around a, a a, a mean uh, in terms of um, our orthopedic and muscular control, blood pressure, heart rate, and many of the other systems. And an allostasis is the uh, the idea that from from a homeostatic you know mean process of regulation, um, our living systems uh, react to stimuli and demand and make an excursion away from homeostasis and then hopefully return to the pre-stimulus level. And then, so those are the two basic notions associated with the dynamic processes our bodies go under. Allostatic load is the, is the concept that talks about what happens when the allostatic process uh, moving uh, in and out of uh, and away from and towards homeostasis doesn't go so good. And that's typically because of accumulative damage of the body cells. Um, either as exposure to, you know, a repeated acute uh, process, uh, which becomes a chronic stressor, and then a change in regulation. And so what's underlined here is really the most important thing, right? It, it, allostatic load represents the physiologic consequence of exposure to uh, fluctuating, fluctuating or heightened neural or neuroendocrine responses that result from repeated uh, acute or chronic stressors. And, and so, there's some indicators uh, in the literature regarding some of the variables, blood pressure, heart rate, and glucose metabolism, which can be picked up in waist-to-hip ratios, and um, our blood lipid profiles, HDL and total cholesterol, uh, glycosylated hemoglobin, which is glucose metabolism, which is related to um, insulin uh, responses, uh, DHEAS sulfate, and cortisol secretions. And epinephrine and norepinephrine. So th th these things, uh, if you're drawing blood, you might be able to see um, whether or not someone might be in an allostatically loaded state, uh, which often is referred to as a, a pre-stress, right? The, the body's already fighting a bunch of battles before you actually give it another battle, like exercise would become for many people. And uh, when someone has a high allostatic load, uh, even apparently small doses of exercise stressors and stimuli uh, might actually cause them local and system responses that are quite negative for them. And so how do you get a read on this uh, at the field level as an exercise professional uh, dealing with, uh, you know, a diverse population aged teenagers to 90s trying to figure out whether or not this person in front of you can tolerate um, the stimuli associated with uh, acute bouts of exercise, let alone the chronic uh, frequent bouts of exercise process and, and the recovery necessary. So uh, what we've done here at Physicians Fitness is 
is come up with a heuristic, um, which is simply right, a, a rule of thumb. So I'm not presenting this heuristic as a highly externally valid um, instrument that's been subject to um, significant epidemiologic study, although I'd like it to. So if anyone wants to help me with that project, I'd be happy to do so. But we needed a, some rules of thumb, some, some indicators that might give us a sense of whether or not this individual standing in front of us that we really don't know anything about um, because we can't see inside them and I'm not a physician and can't draw blood uh, on site. And so we came up with, with these variables uh, that consist of the total heuristic. And so we're looking at the number of medications that someone's currently taking. And we're talking about prescribed medications because um, medications can cause a neural and chemical load on the body for sure. Um, some more than others. Uh, how many injuries someone has accumulated in their lifetime that they can remember? And the problem with uh, history taking, of course, is anamnesis, and not everybody can recall accurately everything that's happened to them, but we've got some uh, question structuring that hopefully stimulates their memories to give us a sense of how many injuries they've had uh, to their body, mechanical injuries, uh, surgeries, um, are definitely uh, stressful events on the body, and uh, any surgery that they have had is something we consider. Um, how many diagnosed diseases they have that a physician has diagnosed, which again shows uh, internal stressors on the system. How many th things they're complaining about, their subjective experience of their own system is important to us. Emotional stressors, uh, age, uh, clearly, you know, some of the ideas associated with age and senescence uh, show us that as we age, unfortunately, um, our ability to make excursions in allostasis and return um, are a bit attenuated. And Spallanzani's law is, is pretty obvious, right? Our ability to recover as we get older, uh, chronologically at least, um, and biologically uh, is hindered. Um, uh, the number of children um, that uh, females have uh, can be a stressful event. Uh, nutritional status, that, that waist to hip ratio, which is a down and dirty, you know, glucose metabolism, uh, insulin um, uh, control process uh, problem that might show up in the body. Edema, swelling in the body, either a pitting edema from uh, a quick screen on the anterior tibia, with some digital compression or swelling in any other part of the body. Uh, body habitus, just the general look of the body. And then we have some actual um, mechanical um, tests that we, that we provide. Uh, what you see there in the SARS is called a system action reaction stability screen where we're actually mechanically perturbing the motor control system to see how somebody reacts to that perturbation because in engineering, the only way we know a system is stable uh, is by perturbing it. And so uh, we are perturbing various parts of the system to get a sense of how well uh, their motor system can generate a reaction and torque via the muscle tension development. And do they have pain? The QMAMC is, is um, formally called the qualitative manual assessment of motor control. That is the term we use for when we use our hands to perturb the body segments in any configuration. Then of course, if they're very sensitive to uh, touch haptic stimulation from either the posture screens or where we are physically touching and poking and prodding them uh, doing the edema test or during any test session. So we're actually taking some um, physiological information at the gross aggregate output level uh, to get a sense of that. And so, uh, Got some more definitions for you about equilibrium and system stability and excursions and amounts and normalness and unstableness and thermal. And so uh, you can you can read some of those definitions that we're using uh, in this context um, and description of this particular content domain. Mechanical, emotional, chemical adaptation, cost, death and normative definitions as well. Uh, so you can reference those in any discussions we're having. So th these are the definitions that I will be um, working under as I use this terminology. And then, of course, hormesis, right? We get to the crux of the matter. You know, how do we dose um, anything for that matter, right? Uh, this idea of stimulating through a dose uh, that produces a beneficial reaction uh, or effect versus a high dose 
uh, which inhibits or creates a toxic effect um, in an exercise, right? People who uh, vomit after exercise uh, are clearly in a toxic chemical environment created by uh, the chemical byproducts of exercise. Uh, rhabdomyolysis would be a toxic effect of um, high dose exercise. So we have any number of uh, physiological excursion problems with excessive doses. And so that's the basic uh, construct here is how do we figure out um, how to get someone uh, from their homeostatic regulatory mean away from that through a stimulation, through exercise, and then hopefully return back to its normal operating window uh, in a way that doesn't cause them uh, a toxic or inhibitory effect on any particular aspect of their physiology. Um, Arne Schultz's law back in the uh, uh, mid to late 1800s and early 1900s, uh, the German psychiatrist and pharmacologist came up with a general law, I think, that fits into this, this idea, right? That a therapeutically applied um, energy uh, and thermal agent, uh, whether it be ultrasonic energy or any energy for that matter, uh, must be of the proper intensity per unit of time to stimulate a desired physiological response. And it can also be seen as stated as uh, a weak stimuli tend to excite physiologic activity. Moderately strong ones favor uh, that activity. Strong ones may retard it and very strong ones uh, will terminate it. And so I've tried to come up with a couple of different um, two-dimensional models, uh, graphical models uh, to depict this, this, this concept of homeostasis and stimulation and, and uh, allostasis and give a sense of uh, how allostatic load might be graphically represented. And so in this picture you see here, um, the outside square represents the hard bond boundary of the system, meaning that an excessive dose leads to the death of the organism. Uh, the inner circle uh, that you see, the, the sort of circle with the orange fill, um, that means there's not enough dose. And so as living organisms, you know, we need some stimulation uh, or, or we die uh, and we get too much stimulation or we die. And so somehow in that green area, whatever parameter you want to look at is this idea of homeostasis, that we're somewhere in between the hard boundary of um, no stimulus uh, and the uh, hard boundary of excessive stimulus. And so I'm going to call that the soft boundary of, of uh, our variables uh, physiologically. And then we have a moderate boundary where adaptation by the system is required in some way. And so uh, we move um, in and out of the soft boundary to the moderate boundary, hopefully in terms of healthy responses. And uh, this, again, is a schematic trying to get a sense of these boundaries and relative distances between the boundaries. And the reason uh, the inner circles are not perfectly uh, circular is the distances between uh, the operating mean, the homeostatic mean, and where the moderate or adaptation boundaries are, um, are not linear for every physiological process. Uh, the excursion windows are different. And so I try to pick up on that here a little bit more uh, in this illustration in that um, you can have a stimulus response in return or an under-stimulus in response to the minimum adaptation limit in terms of stimulus. Uh, the operating window uh, can move outward through a stimulus response to the, to the moderate boundary. And if you go past that, there's some permanent detrimental cost to the organism. There's, a, there's an injury uh, that they're not really going to recover from, and they're going to... Um, live with that for the rest of their existence, kind of the old cliche, right? It's going to leave a mark. And so you can see at the bottom, again, another way to try to graphically illustrate this idea of, of organism health fluctuating across a continuum um, and allostasis being the process of moving away from and, and towards uh, operating means. And so this is necessary, right, this, this interplay between the constancy associated with homeostasis and the variability associated with allostasis. And, and this interplay is fundamentally important uh, to maintaining, let alone improving human health across any number of its physiological parameters. 
Uh, and so um, this concept brought to the uh, exercise uh, realm is what I've been trying to figure out, at least to help trainers at the field level embrace this notion and be sensitive to it and understand that there's four primary taxonomies that we're talking about in regards to um, energetic excursions of the system. Uh, you have thermal excursions. Um, if you get too cold, you get frostbite. If you get too hot, you get a third degree burn. And body temperature is probably one of the most tightly regulated variables in terms of fluctuation away from the mean of almost any other variable in the body. Uh, and so exercise can absolutely affect uh, thermal process in the body, uh, both systemic and local. Uh, you have mechanical excursions, uh, both internal and external, compression, shear, and tension uh, on any number of the body's um, materials. And uh, as a heterogeneous material continuum, um, some of those materials can take more compression than others, take more shear and more tension than others. Of course, vessel pressures and connective tissues and cartilage all have different mechanical properties and um, their own allostatic uh, process. Uh, you have emotional stressors, um, and uh, these can be related to chemical stressors, although we're going to talk about them here in terms of internal stressors in the autonomic nervous system's regulation of, of uh, fear and fight-flight, uh, depression, elation, epinephrine, serotonin, dopamine, um, an array of uh, chemicals that are associated with emotional stressors. Just reading a recent research study um, put out about uh, the role of exercise in, in uh, helping psycho-emotional um, conditions and issues, depending on how it's dosed, right? Because if not, exercise can become an emotional stressor as much as a physical stressor. And then the chemical, uh, both internal, external, and, and toxicity, poisons and pH changes and hormonal uh, and inflammatory um, chemistry uh, can absolutely affect as in the formal definitions we talked about earlier in the neural endocrine system. Lots of problems uh, associated with um, the health of the organism if uh, they are not managed and returned back to their normal operating parameters after an excursion. Uh, so uh, when we look at these four primary taxonomies of energetic excursion, uh, we overlay them on our, our model here, and you can see that, again, each each window has its own distances, if you will, uh, of excursion that it can make. Parts of us can make large mechanical excursions without damage. Um, other parts cannot make large excursions. Uh, there are parts of us uh, that can take a high thermal excursion in any direction, and some that cannot, like fingertips and noses. When you get very cold, they turn black. And that's not good. Uh, and so that's what this picture is trying to um, uh, build into. And if we advance that even more uh, and add the inflammatory responses that might be associated with each of these energy excursions um, that the immune system has to kick in in order to manage that uh, approach to adaptation limits. And then outside of the adaptation limit, you have high instability and allostatic load where there's permanent detrimental costs that the person's walking around with, um, even though uh, you might not be able to see them very readily, just looking at their skin. And this is the primary challenge for exercise professionals, is trying to get some insight into the inside uh, without going inside. So another way to look at it schematically, linearly, um, is uh, depicted here where you have some parameter mean value. And again, the response and return windows uh, for homeostasis and normal allostasis, and then the stimulus uh, either decreasing towards understimulating or increasing towards overstimulating and the adaptation window limit um, indicated as such. And the allostatic load is the window that is outside of the normal response and return window to parameter mean values. Um, and approaching the and staying near the adaptation limits um, or exceeding them uh, ultimately again ending in possible organism death so uh, permanent detrimental costs are what we're trying to avoid uh, exercise is attempting to help someone again through this very interesting dynamic of constancy and variability uh, to improve homeostasis um, 
is done by improving variability up to adaptation limits. And amazingly enough, uh, the body's physiological bod uh, materials and chemistry can change the adaptation limits and expand these operating windows um, in a healthy, systematic way, and which is what we're trying to do with exercise uh, often. Um, but also these adaptation limits mean and operating windows may narrow across some of the um, uh, variables as someone ages and accumulates stressors. And so uh, what you'll see again, um, looking at thermal, mechanical, emotional, and chemical um, primary energy uh, excursion windows, that this back and forth uh, is really what we're trying to manage with exercise and the inflammatory responses that occur uh, as you come outside of normal operating windows and approach or exceed adaptation limits and how organism health either increases or decreases. And so our allostatic load heuristic variables, as we talked about uh, in the opening, consist of, uh, of these particular variables, which are, again, field, aggregate, gross variables, um, meds and injuries treated or untreated and surgeries and diseases diagnosed and complaints of pain and discomfort and emotional stress, um, age and, and the, the West. Them. The good news is, though, uh, the ones I've got listed here in green are clearly changeable. And so someone who has a relatively high allostatic load um, or that we're estimating with our field heuristic uh, can, can improve that allostatic load state um, by taking less medication and maybe some of their diseases uh, through proper diet and exercise and, and emotional health uh, management um, are removed uh, and they don't complain about as many things and they're not as stressed and their glucose management is better and their waist to hip ratio improves. And so when we're talking to our clients about this concept, um, which we do prior to initiating the exercise prescription uh, and even prior to the assessment process, to help them understand why, why it may seem to them like we are we are being very conservative in the initial dose, and so we're trying to justify for them why um, we not, might not be initially crushing them with high intensity interval training and making every exercise session right off the bat this incredibly stressful, burning 3,000 calories per second squared event that so many people think exercise is all about, right? Because exercise, I believe, is still primarily thought of as a weight loss strategy. And if people want to lose it for that, you know, they equate calorie expenditure with that. And so they want to figure out how to burn as many calories as possible per second squared. And so they want the workout to be this incredibly high volume, high intense thing. And we're telling them we're going to try to avoid that if we can, because uh, we don't want to kill you. And so uh, we want their exercise experience to help them. Now, what's interesting about this is uh, when we score it for them and we have a scoring system and it's typical epidemiologic scoring, the lower the score, the higher the load in this case. Uh, we have a questionnaire and points allotted uh, to each one of these particular variables um, to give us, again, um, a psychometric way of, of trying to uh, give us as exercise professionals kind of a third party reference to help us make sure that we're double thinking uh, the initial progressions and, and prescriptions of volume and intensity, how many exercises, you know, we're choosing, which body parts that we, that we're choosing um, to, to start the stimuli uh, of exercise. And so we show them this and we give them a sense of their score and that they can improve their score. And, and this is actually part of the, the goal process because, you know, we use allostatic load and exercise decision making uh, in, a, in a gross sense to give you a, an idea of what we do with a higher load score, which are threes, twos and ones. And, and this drives us to be more conservative and risk averse. So we're taking less sampling. Um, most of the movements are voluntary active myometric and voluntary active isometric. Um, all the motion positions are considered active easy. Uh, we use an RPE one to three and a five point scale for the last repetition of, of however many sets we choose. Uh, we're avoiding fatigue in the session. Um, session durations and frequencies are, are much lower, 15 to 30 minutes, maybe two or three times a week. 
with low volume intensity starting and and we're keeping heart rate responses below ventilatory threshold one for the most part and trying to stay away from painful areas and known trauma areas uh, just trying to get quality of control back we, we really limit plyometric components because we're trying to avoid again inflammatory cascades and delayed onset muscle soreness uh, we don't um, uh, move into positions and motions that put muscles in their shortest and longest positions based on joint angle because that can create some significant end range joint stress and tissue stresses. We usually limit our movements uh, per major synovial joint to one or two. And really the primary goal of the initial phase of the training relationship is just simply to lower uh, the allostatic load um, independent of necessarily any other physiological goals the person might have. So again, this is why we have to um, judge, uh, let them judge um, our decision process by explaining these these concepts to them, um, knowing that we you know we want to get them to a lower load so that we can race their car and they can they can exercise at, at a stimulus level that starts to make the physiological changes that they are hiring us for. Um, and so if someone scores higher, of course, uh, meaning lower load, then we can be more assertive with volume and intensities. And, and motion positions are what we call active hard or RPA 4 or 5 on the five-point scale for last reps. Um, we pick up the number of movements per major synovial joint to 2 to 4, and, and we do start working on areas that, that show historically uh, greatest need or by assessment um, motor control limits and force output limits. Uh, we add more volume and intensity sooner. Um, sessions are longer, frequency might be higher, and we definitely um, work at ventilatory threshold one and two um, as we see them respond to what we're doing. Plyometrics are included, and we will progress to voluntary effort failure uh, at some point. So dialing that in really becomes important because what we're trying to tell our clients is that, look, I don't want to under-treat you. I don't want to underwork on you because if I'm so conservative and risk-averse, uh, that I don't stimulate enough, you won't change. If I overstimulate, you're going to change in a way you don't like. And so we've got to figure out how to dial this in. And so this is some of the, again, bigger picture ideas I wanted to share with you today about how we make that decision process. And so I've got some references for you um, for some of these concepts uh, that might help you if you want to look them up and do some reading on your own if you haven't. So um, that is the uh, the end of my formal presentation on these concepts. And